Okay, so this is God, Grace, and Gumption, take two. We had some technical difficulties earlier this morning that caused the sound not to work on the recording. And so just so that we have an archive of our discussion, uh, the main points of that discussion at least available, um, here we are, me talking to an empty room. So here goes. Um, the main work of Chapter 4 is to recapitulate and reframe in terms so that it fits within this larger systematic project that she's a saying in God's sexuality and the self. Um, she's reframing and recapitulating some research that she did under the auspices of the Church of England Doctrine Commission at the beginning of her career on charismatic Anglicanism. So, in particular, the object of her analysis is a parish which she calls St. Matthew's. St. Matthew's, to make a long story short, underwent a period of charismatic revival and renewal, characterized by things like the speaking of tongues and worship, etc. Um, now, however, they've entered into a new phase of their life together as a parish. Worship is quieter. The speaking of tongues is no longer um, the main flavor of the day in weekly worship, for example. There's a greater attention to tradition, she says, and the minister is trying to steer the parish in particular ways. Um, in reaction to this transition in the life of St. Matthew's, a group from St. Matthew's has split off, and she calls this group the fellowship. The fellowship uh, seeks to maintain and to invigorate the sorts of practices that characterize St. Matthew's at the beginning of renewal, so to maintain the public speaking the public speaking of tongues and worship, uh, certain forms of charismatic leadership, focus on gifts of the Spirit, etc. And so part of what Coakley's trying to do is she's trying to decide how to interpret the transition that St. Matthew's experienced. Is it, as one in the fellowship might say, a kind of reneging on the gifts of the Spirit that were originally given to St. Matthew, such that to leave the parish in order to be able to recover those practices is exactly what you ought to do? Um, or is it, as Coakley suggests as her own thesis, a movement into deeper spiritual maturity, um, one that is no less spiritual than the earlier, um, the earlier vibrancy of charismatic renewal, um, one might say. It's no less spiritual for it being different than the joyousness, she calls it, of that initial period. So, she has recourse, again in this chapter, as she did in the last chapter on the patristic heritage, um, to uh, one of her sociologist darlings, uh, Ernst Trolsch. As I said, I think on the first day of class, Trolsch was the subject of her doctoral dissertation and first book, which was on Trolsch's Christology. Those of you who have taken Sociology 101 or have um, more... Um, more training than I do in sociology of religion, who recognize some of the terms I'm about to lay out very briefly and crudely from the work of Trolsch's colleague, Max Weber. Weber did his work in dialogue with Trolsch and Trolsch in dialogue with Weber. They were BFFs, as it were. Um, and so the purposes to which they put these different terms, uh, there's some contestation over the, the term sect, for example, and what exactly it means, um, they will be different between Weber and Trolsch. So I'll try to lay out um, briefly here at the beginning exactly what Trolsch means, well, exactly what Coakley means by Trolsch's category of sect, church, and mystic. So to briefly recapitulate from last time, uh, there are three sorts of Trinitarian, there, how, how should I say this? There, there were three varieties of Trinitarianism in the early church, which Coakley was concerned to delineate. So the first was this idea that particular persons of the Trinity were associated with particular forms of experience. So in particular, she was focused on, um, you remember this from our discussion of the Montanists. Um, the, the, you normally have a focus on an experience of one particular person rather than a simultaneous experience of all three persons, and that particular experience with a particular person of the Trinity is associated with particular gifts. So we, just an example, uh, one has an experience of the Spirit, and that experience of the Spirit cashes out in the speaking of tongues. This is something which she claims is characteristic of the sect in Trolsch's vocabulary. We'll review all these terms in just a minute. Characteristic of the sect is her hypothesis. The second form of Trinitarian reflection, or yeah, Trinitarian spirit, 
um, is the reflexive or incorporative trinity. This idea that the trinity is basically talking to itself um, in some sense. There's, a, um, there's an emphasis on the incorporative work that the spirit does. Um, the spirit puts you in the thick of the Trinitarian life and dialogue. One occupies the slot of the Son by the Spirit dwelling within you and praying within you the cry that is appropriate to the Son, which is Abba, Father. One receives the Spirit of adoption. And of course, this is exposited with recourse to Romans 8. Uh, Romans 8 appears all over the place in the last chapter as in the patristic works which she's analyzing. The third sort is her account of the linear trinity, which is, uh, the way we explained it last time, is it's a little more, um, oh, how should we say, a little straighter, right? It's a little more straight-jacketed. Um, the spirit is still one's entryway into the trinity, but it's more like um, it's more like if one's pulling the chain of the Trinity down, right? One grabs a hold of the Spirit, pulls some more, and then one gets a hold of the Son, and then one pulls a little bit more, and then one gets hold of the Father. And so there's a kind of ascent um, to this linear account of the Trinity. Her suggestion is that that's associated with the church type, um, a more institutional, um, yeah, a more institutional type of uh, Christian faith. The worry being that the reflexive Trinity maintains too much of this emphasis on the spirit, which lends itself to some subversive tactics vis-a-vis -vis the established church. Uh, we discussed this in relation to Montanism, for example, in the releasing of women into positions of authority, um, or with regard to the reflexive trinity, the worry in origin um, that this particular form of prayer might, um, that this particular form of prayer needed to be limited to the monastic elites because it was simply too erotically dangerous for the laity, uh, yeah, for the laity to essay unsupervised. In any case, she thinks that the reflexive trinity is somewhere between these two, and it's um, it's part of the mystic type. It's a mystic type within the church type, or at least this is the hypothesis which she's going to test in this field work at this parish she's calling St. Matthew's. So. The reason for recourse to Trolsch, the reason for her interest in Trolsch, is that Trolsch provides a way to theorize the connection between doctrine and life. He's asking what forms of institutional life correlate with which particular forms or construals of doctrine. If you recall in one of the footnotes in this chapter, she talks about the last couple, and I mean like, three or four pages of this massive multi-volume work that Trolsch has, um, has worked on. Um, his, yeah, his masterpiece. Anyway, at the very end of this, he, he speculates what a Christology and soteriology might look like for both the church type, the sect type, and the mystic type. Um, anyway, it's very interesting. And so that's the interest primarily, I think, that Coakley has in Trolsch. It's a way to theorize the connection between doctrine and life, between particular construals of doctrine and the forms of institutional life that they encourage and in which they are articulated. So, we need to get clear, first of all, on what exactly these categories are constituted by. So, start with the church type. The church type is, by and large, conservative and universal. Uh, it seeks to dominate. It seeks to, it has a universal ambition, so it seeks to be the institution, the, the religious institution for the whole world, for the whole society, and oftentimes conspires in, um, conspires in collaboration with the state to this end. Uh, conservative in the broadest sense, conservative in the sense of trying to maintain and shore up the institution itself. The sect, on the other hand, is smaller. It's a smaller group. It doesn't have the same sort of universal ambition to it. It's non-universal, and it focuses on conscious individual conversion. Okay, the emphasis is here on a conscious individual conversion. It's not the idea that, as in the church, you might be born into the church, like one is born into the society. One is English, and therefore one is Anglican or something like that. Um, instead, you make a conscious decision to join 
the sex. And there's a focus here on personal holiness, perfection, etc. Now these types, particularly um, the, even the church and the sect types, which seem to be the most clearly delineated of the three, even they don't exist in isolation from each other, right? So these are useful heuristic tools in order to, you know, make sense of sociological and theological data. They're ideal types in the vocabulary of um, Trotter's friend and Faber. They're not intended to be, um, they're not intended to be absolute. Most often, I think that most of us find ourselves in parish contexts that are some mixture of both. An example that comes to my mind of a sect within a church is uh, 18th century Methodism. Right? So Methodism arises within the church from the Holiness Club in Oxford. Uh, the conversations um, uh, consolidated around the Wesley brothers, right? And they are still um, obsessed with holiness. Um, but they, they can kind of form a sort of, um, a sort of sect within the church. Um, normally, sects, just as Coakley explains, are, uh, they're motivated by a conviction in the laxity of church practice. So the church is not spiritually rigorous enough or something like that. Certainly that was true of the Methodist movement. Um, they thought that the Church of England was simply not spiritually rigorous enough, spiritually rigorous enough, and um, Wesley's doctrine of perfection, his strong account of sanctification, etc., his emphasis on the holiness of life, leads them to become this group within the church. Of course, uh, in other contexts, as Methodism moves out into, uh, into the world through colonialism, um, in the American context, it, Methodism separates from the Church of England um, and becomes, as we now know it today, a kind of denomination in and of itself. And there's some debate as to whether or not the church type really aligns with the denomination. There's an intra-sociological debate that she refers to here um, between Trolsch and uh, Niebuhr, for example, as to whether or not this topology does justice to the American context in particular, and that debate is mostly, or at least somewhat, about the relationship between the church type and what Americans know as denominationalism. Um, in any case, the, there's a kind of transition in Methodism, where Methodism becomes more institutionalized, as we now experience it in the American context. In any case, different religious movements can take different forms over the course of their history. They can be lodged one inside the other. It just goes to show that this topology is meant to be heuristic as a kind of tool for analysis. It's not meant to be a sort of absolute or uh, to constitute discrete categories into which different forms of religious thought and practice can be sorted. So between them, or as uh, she describes it as the, the wolf to the warp of church and sect, is the mystic type. And the mystic type in Trolsch's thought is by and large individual, which she wants to contest. And she contests it, you'll remember, um, by way of Weber's concept of charisma, which uh, has, a more, has, a, has a more concentrated interest in the social effects of the mystic and of mystic uh, charismatic leadership, etc. So the mystic uh, in Trolsch's terms is individual. Perhaps this is partly because Trolsch himself thought of himself, it's suggested, as a mystic, um, as a mystic within the church type. But what the individualism of the mystic allows this category to do is this category can exist in either the church or the sect. So Coakley affirmed there is an individual, um, there's an individual component to the mystic type. Um, certainly there is, but this, uh, she demands that we also pay attention to the way that it can be lodged within a church type and the way in which mysticism itself has profoundly social and communal effects. So, uh, so much by way of introduction to these. She thinks that these three forms of Trinitarianism, or in the case of the first, of you know, sort of um, the lack thereof, um, kind of correlate with these categories. The, the idea is that the reflective trinity falls somewhere between the church and the mystic is the mystic type within the church type. Um, an example of this would be origin, uh, paradigmatically, I would think. The linear trinity is a solidly church type. Um, she suggested that the linear trinity is an attempt to kind of put the spirit in the spirit's place, um, given the fact that the spirit blows where it wills and seems to be stirring up trouble um, 
the case of the Montanists, you know, this releasing of uh, women into positions of authority, the idea of continual continuing revelation, etc., the challenge of the church's authority. So the linear trinity is sort of the attempt to straitjacket the trinity into a place of safety for the institutional church. And then the sect is associated with this, um, you have a particular experience of a particular person that cashes out a particular sorts of gifts, um, more along the lines of the Luke Acts um, depiction of the spirits working which comes from that biblical exegesis that we did two weeks ago. So, this is what she's trying to test in her in these interviews that she's running with uh, this congregation, St. Matthew's. Now, there are three questions that she wants to ask each of the people she interviews, and you can find those on um, page 168, note 22. The first is, how did you first come into Christian renewal, and how would you describe prayer in the Spirit? The second question is, have you experienced the gift of tongues yourself? How do you assess the effect of tongues in your congregation? And third, what are the main difficulties you yourself confront in prayer? And she goes on to say that she didn't explicitly ask them about gender, sex, or sexuality. She simply allowed those issues to bubble up as they would. We'll return to that at the very end. Um, there were no explicit questions asked about sexuality. So I want to just very briefly and quickly give you the sweep of the results of her analysis and the sorts of theological conclusions she's trying to draw from them. So to the first question on this initial experience of the Spirit, both those at um, St. Matthew's and at the Fellowship um, had it, answers that were basically consonant with one another. And this made sense because they would have both been at St. Matthew's at the time during this initial charismatic renewal. So uh, what was most important, though, about their response is that they confirmed the account of prayer that Copley was describing with recourse to Romans 8, this reflexive trinity. Um, so she says on page 169, there was the reiterated remark that people had found um, prayer to be a two-way relationship, not just a talking at God, but God, the Holy Spirit, already cooperating in their prayer, energizing it from within, and no less also responding in it, alluring them again, inviting them into a continuing adventure. So this is described to be, quote, the real thing, quote, making yourself a channel for the Spirit's work, etc. Um, in any case, oh, and she says that the Romans 8 theme was clearly stated and acknowledged and even made central by these informants. So there is, again, as I said, um, I think two weeks ago, the idea that you feel, the, you feel God praying inside of you. It's not simply that I'm sending God a text message, and that's the way that my, that's the way that prayer works. I send God a message and then God texts me back or something like that. Instead it's more like I am shot, I'm, I'm thrown into the thick of a conversation that's already going on and God prays inside of me. One of the experience, one gets out of the way and allows for the spirit to pray within you. Now she is clear that they were not giving this, um, they were not giving this explicitly Trinitarian explication. So they weren't exactly, they, they weren't so consciously affirming her account of the reflexive Trinity. Um, she thinks that this is um, this is odd and perhaps even unfortunate, given the fact that at this time, um, liberal Anglican thinkers, uh, one should think of Morris Wiles from a couple weeks ago, uh, the, the um, one of the yeah the, the the liberal Anglican scholar who Copley says was appealing to a kind of uh, was appealing to biblical data in order to promote a binitarianism, a drama between the Father and the Son, which had no real role for the Spirit, or if it had a role, it was not a role that was co-equal with the Father and the Son. Um, at this time, when these sorts of liberal theology, liberal challenges to the doctrine of the Trinity were proliferating in the Church of England, um, that these charismatics would have such a profound experience of the Spirit and yet not draw those doctrinal implications to refute uh, that the liberal critique of Trinitarianism should just say that there's a kind of an untapped power and potential in the fact that the Spirit seems to be so central to their piety and prayer um, and worship, um, whereas these academic theologians seem to be saying, oh, well, the Spirit's not all that important, doesn't really play that big of a role, it doesn't necessarily have to be co-equal with the Father and the Son, or why even divide the persons at all, etc. So, she wants to give that explicitly Trinitarian coinage, uh, but she was not getting that necessarily from the parishioners themselves. So, uh, the other thing that I might note is that the experience of prayer, this experience of God praying inside one to God, so God prays within you to God, um, 
also rendered prayer no longer one activity or duty amongst others. I'm reading from page 170, but the wellspring of all activities. And this gave new life to Paul's injunction in 1 Thessalonians, she says, to pray constantly, etc. So, there's some confirmation of her Romans 8 in corporate trinity in this initial experience of the Spirit at St. Matthew's. Second question is on the use of tongues. So here, the two groups diverged quite a lot, um, and diverged in ways that were important for understanding the motivations of the fellowship group uh, for splitting off from St. Matthew's in order to form their own, uh, their own, you know, their own community. Um, she says that the Anglican Charismatics at St. Matthew's had now almost ceased to use tongues in public worship, uh, the exception being the occasional unplanned and eerily beautiful use of corporate singing in tongues, whereas the fellowship group deliberately encouraged corporate praise in tongues, often uh, in jubilant, noisy introductions to their services, and they claimed a much greater cutting edge and specificity, too, to their public prophecies. So... She does say that the worship at St. Matthew's now has moved into a different phase, right? Um, the public use of tongues is no longer as pronounced as it was, um, if it's there at all. That doesn't mean, though, that the speaking in tongues completely went away. Rather, she says that uh, the folk at St. Matthew's were saying that they used tongues as a kind of private love language for their prayer life, for their personal prayer life. Um, and this moved them in a direction that she thinks is more characteristic of the mystic type, it reminds her quite a lot of contemplative forms of prayer. So though parishioners at St. Matthew's were skeptical of mantric or repetitive forms of prayer, these are the forms of prayer that, um, that uh, Father Peter, Pastor Martha, and myself have been uh, teaching folk in the congregation of St. Mark's about as part of our series on the mystic way in the world today, um, you know, using the Jesus prayer, for example. Lord Jesus Christ, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And saying that over and over and over into, it, in order to recollect the self and concentrate it so that it can make its way into God. Um, they were skeptical of this, th these sorts of prayers, skeptical of more overtly contemplative forms of prayer and ways of thinking about it. However, they would admit that their tongues often became repetitive and could be considered to serve the same purpose. And so she was able to draw a kind of, um, she was able to draw a connection, uh, an affinity, between the way that the private use of tongues worked at St. Matthew's and the way that contemplative prayer practice worked. Another important thing was that, um, was that the folk of St. Matthew's would consider this private speaking in tongues to be a shortcut to God, or, quote, getting out of the way, end quote, so that the Spirit could act directly, a prayer for when, quote, words fail, end quote, and for becoming, quote, like a child, end quote. Um, etc. So the theme of ceding to the Spirit was stressed, she says, on page 173, the way in which the tongues averted one's normal and natural tendency to, quote, set the agenda, end quote, especially in areas of counseling and illness. So uh, when we hear this language of ceding control of the Spirit, we should definitely hear resonances and echoes of that first essay on kenosis that I covered at the very beginning of the course, that essay from uh, quite early on in her career, where she's discussing the need in contemplation to, um, or the need to engage in contemplative practice in order to venture a kind of gentle effacement of the self, such to render it transparent to the Spirit's work in a seeding of control to the Spirit, a refusal to grasp, at a, grasp after worldly forms of power such that one yeah, one, one, one empties oneself so that one can be filled with divine power. Um, in any case, we should hear resonance back to that. Uh, the, the research that she's done here has really um, affected her quite dramatically um, and powerfully from the very beginning of her career uh, to now. I think it's very evident uh, the impact that this has had on her account of the reflexive trinity that we find in this book. I'm just, I just mean to draw the parallel to that early work on kenosis. Uh, this idea of ceding to the Spirit, ceding control to the Spirit, refusing to set the agenda in prayer, etc. So, um, I think that's probably all I need to say there. Um, the, third, the third question that she asks is also perhaps the most interesting. Um, it's uh, this, this question about 
uh, what are the most, uh, what are the difficulties that one often finds in prayer? And she describes this on um, 176 with, in terms of three different uh, difficulties. There's failure, aridity, or dryness, and depression. Um, so the question is how to interpret one's feelings of failure. Um, so there's a disagreement, a, a subtle disagreement between St. Matthew's and the fellowship um, and their, their forms of spirituality um, as to both as to what counts as failure and as to what use the spirit might put to failure. Um, so she described on 176 a, um, a middle-aged scientist, um, a man who had wanted to speak in tongues and who had often asked God to speak in tongues. This is a parishioner of St. Matthew's. Um, who had often prayed to be able to speak in tongues, but was never able to, for one reason or another. Um, he had come to a place, though, where he did not see that, quote, failure to, play in, to pray in tongues as a sign that he was less than, um, less holy than those who were able to, but simply that um, he had to, quote, bow to God's sovereignty. Um, and that it was a means of teaching him humility. Um, so there was a use to which the Spirit put that so-called failure in prayer. Um, second, there's this attitude toward aridity or dryness. Um, many of those, she says, in both the fellowship and the St. Matthew's group, but particularly in the fellowship, felt that felt that um, happiness and elation ought to be the primary affective experience of this form of prayer. Um, there were, however, an increasing number of folks, she says, at, um, at St. Matthew's in particular, um, who were beginning to see that dryness not as a failure of prayer, not as the absence of, I don't want to say this, I don't want to say that. Um, we're beginning to see the, that failure of prayer as part of the process of being made one with God in prayer. So the feeling of dryness, um, the feeling of desertion and of abandonment was a way of, quote, driving one into the desert to sharpen one's thirst. Um, just as Jesus was driven into the wilderness to be tested and tempted, just as Jesus, um, just as Jesus uh, felt abandoned by God on Golgotha and was vexed in his soul at Gethsemane, and just as the um, early spiritual fathers of the church were driven themselves into the literal desert, um, so also their dryness was not a sign of spiritual immaturity, but actually of spiritual maturity. Not only was this seeming um, unhappiness or um, this prayer that had lost its sweetness, um, not only was this not a sign that God was not working in their lives, it actually was a sign that God was more seriously, more concentratedly working paradoxically through this feeling that God was absent. So this is um oh this is uh this is related by Coakley to John of the Cross's Night of the S Night of Sense. Okay, this is the first uh, the Night of Sense comes before the Night of Spirit, which we're gonna talk about in just a second. Uh, this is laid out in his dark night of the soul. It's a feeling of failure and um of God's uh, feeling of failure in prayer and of God's absence. Um, so one the prayer loses its sweetness as I said and yet she says, is characterized by a continuing and restless desire for God. So, a form of prayer that's not as emotionally satisfying as it was before, as she says, but it is still prayer nonetheless. Um, and they're relating this to this, uh, so that the Spirit might drive on it into the desert. So, uh, the, the third of these difficulties in prayer uh, is this, uh, is the matter of depression. So, She's careful at the very end of this section to appeal to the Anglican minister at St. Matthew's himself, who draws a sharp distinction between desolation, which is a spiritual condition, and depression. Um, she states that it is a very complex matter 
to disentangle, in some cases, spiritual desolation from depression. Um, as a priest, I want to be on the record as saying that, that the dark night of the soul uh, that, uh, that, that John of the Cross is working out is not to be equated with clinical depression. Um, while spiritual desolation and clinical depression are often wrapped up with one another, um, I think the recommendation that Coakley, um, that Coakley makes here Sorry, I'm just trying to find the, the, the passage in particular. Um, that depression and desolation might be difficult to disentangle without the discernment of an advanced spiritual guide is a very important one. Um, most important, though, for the theological account that she's trying to set out, this feeling of desolation um, is not interpreted by her or increasingly by um, some of the folks at um, St. Matthew's. Um, it's not interpreted as a, it's not interpreted as a, um, as a spiritual condition that is removed from God. It's not interpreted as a kind of short-circuiting of the spiritual process. Rather, it is another step in spiritual maturity. In fact, it is these spiritual desolations are considered to be a movement through the night of the cross itself, a, um, a being joined to Christ in Christ's passion. There is a painfulness to be remade in the likeness of Christ through prayer, and this is considered to be a sign of spiritual maturity rather than being a sign that one is somehow, um, one is a, a bad Christian for not being happy and elated and for prayer not feeling good all the time. There's actually a, there's an appropriateness to prayer not feeling good, uh, according to Coakley, as one moves through this particular stage. This is, um, she, she has recourse here to, again, to John of the Cross's Dark Night of the Soul, to the second night, to the night of spirit, in which um, if in the night of sense God feels absent and removed, in the night of spirit God is painfully, purgatively, she says, close to the sinner. Um, one is inflamed with, uh, she says using T.S. Eliot's words, the flame of incandescent terror. Um, the second night of the spirit, I'm just going to read from 179, is the one in which God draws so painfully and purgatively close that the experience is akin to that of a log being thrown into a devouring fire. The idea is that God's holiness just is such, that when our sinfulness comes into contact with it, our sinfulness is burned up, it is consumed, and this process of purgation is, uh, it, it cashes out in an affective state that is painful. Um, and so the idea is that Christ's spirit might not simply be a, um, oh, she says it here, a comforting dove, but also this flame from Ellie, this flame of incandescent terror. And the question she asks on 180 is, could it be that the acceptance of Christomorphic pain is part and parcel of the full acceptance of Trinitarianism in the church type of Christianity? She is uh, careful to caution against um, stating that we should accept all pain and sufferings uh, regardless of their genesis or, um, or their type. She's going to need to parse out exactly um, what sorts of pain and suffering she's talking about here. I think most important for our theological purposes is to recall that in the little diagram, always uh, wrote up on uh, this side of the board, of the reflexive trinity or the movement of the prayer into God, it is always... Um, that this slot of the sun where we end up by the spirit dwelling within us is always the sun for her on the cross. Now the end result, of course, is resurrection, but a movement through Christ's crucifixion, through the passion, has been part and parcel of Coakley's account from the beginning. It is our sinful desires, for example, from I think the second class, um, our sinful desires are broken uh, uh, against the hardwood of the cross. They are thrown into the crucible of divine desire and they're purged within that. In any case, this is a kind of structural commitment for 
her, this emphasis on a movement through the crucifixion rather than around it. Um, and this is, uh, this is evident here in the discussion of these prayer practices. Um, here at the end, I want to say again that uh, clinical depression is very different from spiritual desolation. Um, there is a spiritual desolation, she's trying to argue in dialogue, and uh, in dialogue both with these, uh, with these interviewees and with the tradition of Carmelite spirituality coming out of John Lee Cross. There's a form of desolation that is part and parcel of the spiritual life, of the journey of the soul into God, and so it, and it's intended by God in some fashion. Depression is not that. So you need the care and attention of a pastoral advisor, of a spiritual director, as well as a psychotherapist in order to disentangle these two, because they can be quite intimately wrapped up in one another. But one should, one is subject to medical rectification, and the other is part of this process of spiritual purgation as one makes one's way into God. Um, in any case, I think those are the broad strokes of what she's discussing in this chapter of, um, yeah, I th so we, we've covered the, the different types of Christian organization and the forms of doctrine with, uh, with which they're kind of correlated. Um, she does find in this fieldwork confirmation of her theory that a more a stricter kind of linear form is with the church type. Uh, we might think of this um relation to some of her comments about um, about the um, the Archbishop of Canterbury Runcie, um, who wanted to who intended this report that Coakley was writing for the Doctrine Commission to be a, a, a kind of cold shower for the charismatic constituency in the church um, versus this a sect type who has more of an emphasis on the gifts of the spirit um, and then we have the mystic type, which is somewhere in between. So we have the potential for this Romans 8 reflexive trinity by situating the mystic type within the church type. And that's what she thinks St. Matthews is moving to become. Um, yeah, I think, that's, I, think that's, I think that's pretty much all that I need to say this week. I will say that one of the most pastorally helpful um, things about this account of prayer is that it means that if you don't think you're very good at praying, you might actually be very far on the way to union with God. That what feels like failure may not actually constitute failure in the strict sense. I think it's a very, it's a, it's a useful part of the spirituality that's being saved here. So in any case, I think that's all for this week. Next week's, uh, next week's discussion will be on uh, the, the chapter on iconography. Uh, my recommendation to folks in class today was that you figure out what you're interested in. So read the first part of the chapter, a little discussion of um, Hans Georg Gadamer, and, uh, who runs a theory of hermeneutics, which helps her get the theological account of uh, how to read an icon going. So read that stuff from the very beginning, but then pick and choose your way around the rest of the chapter, and then bring your interests to class next week, and we'll try to put together a holistic picture of the account being, uh, being ventured in what is really a very long chapter, because we, we need to move on to the last two chapters of the book, which is an exploration of John Donne, and then a return to the Pseudo-Dionysius, the problem of the divine name, um, and uh, an account of Trinitarian ecstasis, a movement into the imminent trinity. Thus far, we have mostly been concerned with the economic trinity or the trinity and its relationship with creation. In any case, I'll see you next week. Thanks.